Hello, and welcome to Mid-American Gardener, the show where we talk plants. You can either call in, we take emails, but we always talk plants. And if you'll notice that it's a little different here, I'm replacing Diane Nolan, who lost her singing voice over the weekend. So I've scrubbed up and washed off and taken her place. But as always, she's left us with a great panel. And I'm gonna go ahead and introduce them. But before I introduce them, I'll introduce myself. My name is Shane Coultra. I'm with Country Arbor's Nursery in Urbana. And we also have Culture Nurseries in Onarg, Illinois. I answer questions a little bit about everything. I have a garden center, so I get to hear it all day. Perennials, annuals, trees, a little bit of everything. So I'll chime in if I can help out a little bit. But we have a great panel tonight, and they pretty much can cover it themselves. But I, I will help out a little bit. So I'm going to start off with Dyke Barkley. Dyke, right. introduce yourself. My name is Dyke Barkley, and I'm from Paris, Illinois. Um, I teach the horticulture program down at uh, Lakeland College in Mattoon. And I also own uh, my own nursery, Barkley Farms, specializing in perennials and ornamental grasses. Um, start off answering maybe a couple of uh, questions that came in. Somebody asked about a uh, yellow trumpet vine, and they have it on an arbor, but they're having trouble with shoots popping up all over beds, and as many as, uh, I mean, as far as 20 feet away, and what can they do? Actually, not, not a whole lot. That's one of the downfalls of that plant. It's very vigorous and very tough and easy to grow, almost to the point of, of getting out of control. But uh, spading out those shoots is about the only thing. Uh, you, you try and start spraying, you're going to have some problems that is connected to the original plant. This plant could also self-seed. If you got seedlings, you could knock those down. But it's sending up shoots, you just got to spade them out. Nothing really easy to do other than that. Um, second question I've got is uh, uh, Viburnum lantana, um, also the cultivar Mohican, or uh, several names, the uh, wayfaring tree Viburnum. Nice, big, heavy, uh, dense leaf Viburnum. They were wanting to know how fast. They planted it as a privacy fence. How fast would it take off and grow? Uh, typical uh, tough shrub, it'll sit there for a year, maybe so, and get some roots down, and then in, uh, by year two and three, you're gonna really say it take off. You should have a pretty nice hedge in that in three to four years. It'll eventually get up to eight feet and really fill in. Uh, biggest thing I would say as it grows, kind of thin it maybe if it gets out of control instead of, instead of topping it, thin it back and keep it that way. I've got some that have been in my yard for, for 15, 18 years and looks great. Very low maintenance, tough plant for good condition. Yeah, that's condition. one of the, the, most people say they want something really fast and really quick and really aggressive, and then you're getting the other side of the question. Yeah. 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 Okay, now it's aggressive and really big and really fast, <laughs> now, now what do I do? <laughs> so you had both ends of it there, so yeah. we hear that all the time. Very true. Yeah, those are, those are good questions. All right, uh, we've got a, another panelist, Marty, introduce yourself, and you got a few questions as well. My name is Marty Alanya, I'm a private landscaper and we do have a few questions. We had quite a few questions, but trying to choose the ones we could be quickly answered. Um, <coughs> someone wrote in, so they're a novice rose grower, they got black spot, they bought a medicine to spray on them. When should they apply it? They're starting to leaf out. Now, um, I don't think I'd put it on until you see a little bit of black spot. Um, you also would want to, any leaves that fell last year, you want to make sure you clean those up because black spot is a fungus and it'll live in the soil in your mulch and it will plague your roses. So that's where it initiates and I don't know what it was you bought. I assume they told you at the garden center that it was for black spot. You can certainly use that. Please use it according to the instructions. And you can also combat black spot with milk. You can milk and water, one part milk to about seven parts water and put it in a spray bottle and spritz it on. You have to reapply it after it rains, but you have to do that with this, the stuff that you bought too. And I'm thinking you'll probably find milk is cheaper. Also try to get it on the undersides, not just the tops of the leaves. That's really important. And again, picking up the leaves that fall is really essential to your black spot issue. Also, if it really gets tiresome, you can plant roses that are not susceptible to black spot. And someone wrote in, the west side of their house gets so much sun that the siding is affected. Buckling, I assume. There's about eight feet between the house and the fenced property line. Would we recommend trellis with vines of some kind to help shade the house? You could do that. You could. Um, you could actually put those right inside the fence. I'm guessing the fence is probably a six foot privacy fence since it's a written question. I, don't, I can't ask questions. Um, 
but you'd want to make it taller. I'm, I'm thinking you might want to think about a tree of some kind, a few, with a small footprint, with a narrow footprint. If you go to your local garden center, you could see what they could recommend for you. There's, uh, there are several very narrow evergreens, very tall columnar plants that might be able to, to do you a little better job than, than trellises with vines, because the trellises are going to be really tall. All right. Yeah, there's some good suggestions there. And Jim, we're just going to do your show and tell only, right. so we'll go ahead yep. and uh, show them what you got for us. Uh, introduce yourself as well. Okay. Well, first of all, I'm Jim Schuster. I'm a retired horticulturist and plant pathologist with the University of Illinois. And I brought the disease called black knot. And this is a disease of plants in the prunus genus, which include plums, cherries, apricots, and all that. And this disease tends to be worse on the edible plums more so than the ornamental plums, but it also likes like black cherry and choke cherry more than the edible cherries. Uh, but this is going to first start off with the one here on the left, brown in the first year, and then towards the end of the first summer, but definitely by the second summer, it has turned black and is much larger. And then in this one here, um, it starts getting a white fungus, which is parasitic on the black knot. And that white fungus will start towards the end of the second year, but definitely will be there by the third year. By the time you've seen these, it's kind of, you missed it, the, the deal here. Uh, <laughs> what you're going to need to do is in the winter time, uh, we want it below freezing preferably, and the plant is 100% dormant, you're going to prune this out at least a minimum of six to eight inches below the gall but even lower uh, if you need to get down to a side branch or where you can see a visible bud. Uh, then, if you want to spray, there is now a, a chemical for it called calcium polysulfate, or sulfide, I should say, and it requires two applications, and they are put on when the plant is dormant, and you need to do that, do that two years in a row. And that's basically what you need. And with the, when you prune out the samples, you need to destroy them. Burn them if you can, and if you're not allowed to burn, they go hole and bury them about a foot deep until they rot away. But if you do, if you trim it out and treat it, the tree should be okay. Or? Yes, if you don't do anything, this disease will eventually kill the tree. But uh, yeah, if you do the pruning at the right time uh, and maybe the cal uh, calcium polysulfide, uh, two years in a row, they're supposed to help minimize having. Now that doesn't mean it won't come back. Yeah. But it, you know, this should keep the tree alive and bearing. Yeah, because we have a lot of Canada red cherries or choke cherries, and, and they tend to be tend to get that quite often. Yeah. So that's that's really good information. All right, we're going to start answering some phone calls, and we're going to go ahead and start with line two, blackberries. Hi. Hi. Uh, we're going to transplant some blackberries, and I was wondering uh, when we're going to dig them, and do we cut the canes off when we transplant them? Yeah. yeah. Take that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cut them down to, oh, you know, six inches. Easy to get a hold of, really. And just, just spade under them. They transplant very easily and they reestablish pretty quickly. Are they thornless? Because I'd totally get the thornless ones. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I <laughs> Much easier. Okay, thank you. Sure. Yeah, that's, that's, we pretty much dig them up, cut them down. Oh, yeah. Kind of like what we do with shrubs. It's, it's the yeah. same thing, just get some of the cane off leaves off and yeah they come right back and the, yeah. and the roots are kind of woody you know kind of knobbly and they just they take right off yeah, they take right off just water them in well and then when you bake a pie go ahead and send it in yeah, that's right, <laughs> that's right. All right we're going to go on to line three you got a question about hydrangeas yes uh good evening i would like to know uh, i've got endless summer hydrangeas and i uh give them aluminum sulfate to turn them blue and I want to know if I should also feed them with uh, acid lovers fertilizer. Fertilizer for acid loving plants. Have you tested your soil? Have you have you, you tested your that? soil for the pH? Yeah, well she says she uses aluminum sulfate, so yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I, 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 you guys can chime in on this one, yeah. but generally once you've gotten your soil level with the aluminum sulfate, you don't necessarily have to use an acid-loving acid fertilizer. Yeah. I'd go to a slow-release yeah, uh, normal or you know whatever fertilizer you're going to use. I don't 
tend to acidify with the fertilizer okay. as well. Okay. So that's but, what I wonder. But okay. that's what Marty's asking. Just make you know, yeah, you obviously kinda, you want acidic soil yeah. and then once you've gotten that then you don't really have to worry about it with the fertilizer. Yeah, if you're there, then you're there, you know. A little okay, top dressing every other year or something should maintain it unless you're right up against the concrete somewhere. You know, so. I'm glad that wasn't the, it's not blooming, how should I trim it question. Yeah, <laughs> I, I thought that was coming from a mile yeah. away. No. <laughs> okay, uh, we've got another question. Uh, line four, we've got a question about potatoes. Good timing this time of year. Hi. Uh, we moved down here about three years ago from Michigan, and I, used to, I tried growing t uh, potatoes up there a couple times, and I always got the potato bugs. How do you grow potatoes without getting the potato bugs? You don't. <laughs> <laughs> they live here and they like potato plants and that's what you got. Um, you, know, uh, you can certainly spray for them. If you have a small enough patch, you can just go out and pick them off. Drop them in a bucket of soapy water if you want to be organic about it, which I try to lean toward. Because remember, pesticides that you use don't just usually kill the bug you're after they kill a lot of other bugs that you would prefer to leave alive correct so. I mean that's what I did in Michigan is I just yeah. picked them off but I just thought maybe there was some trick to to growing potatoes without uh, not potato that bugs. I know <laughs> of Dyke got anything no, <laughs> no. <not>. you just <laughs> just yeah. gotta just gotta struggle them you can try row covers you could do that you know put put the hoops on and put some some poly row cover over it so the bugs can't get to them a okay. little bit you could give that a spin um, yeah, that's that's all I have too. I'm not alive, a potato yeah. expert, but that's yeah, there's no miracle trick on that one. So. Mm -mm. Or I appreciate the question. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna well. move on to uh, another question. Uh, line five is asking a question: Is it too wet to transplant a tree? Is there is a person behind that question? <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, it, as much as it's rained today, is it too wet to plant a uh, transplant a tree, or should have wait a day or two and let the ground kind of settle back a little bit. Well, I don't, I'm not sure what area you're in or how much rain you have gotten, but yeah, <laughs> well, it is. It's it's I think it's going to be more it's than weird. a day or two. Also, yeah, I'm thinking Since you're going to have to wait about a week. Oh, I it's think that's it's probably. Yeah, I saw an arc going down the street. But there. as far as getting there. into a soil, you know, we have this every day because we plant trees every day. Yeah. It's can you get into the area and actually physically do the work? Yeah. And two, are you causing more damage around the surrounding area while you're there? Are you mudding it in because you're yeah. going to compact the soil and. You, yeah. you won't do as good a job when it's raining. There's just so many things going yeah. on. But as far as hurting the tree and putting in a wet hole, when you generally plant a, hole, a, a, a tree, you dig a hole. And, and my father always taught me to fill that hole with well, water. Anyway, yeah. I don't do it as much yeah. anymore because it's such a mess. <laughs> but that's how you used to do it. You dig a hole, fill it with water, and put the tree in. So obviously that's okay. Yeah. But as far uh, you as just us, don't want to make mud balls. You don't want to. Yeah. If it's that gummy yeah. wet, then it'll just yeah. set up and be big clods. But uh, yeah. it'll be a week before I plant the tree. The other question I have is: we uh, had to remove two pines and a maple tree, and I had the stumps ground, uh, and I put the grindings around other trees, dug a trench around them about two or three inches deep, and I put the uh, grindings about level with the soil. Is there anything wrong with that? I don't know if there's anything wrong, although it's ground up wood, but yeah, you don't want it too deep. And it's also going to take yeah, the nitrogen gonna, out. Yeah, yeah, it sucks the, the nitrogen out of your plant when it's fresh wood. Yeah, when, when wood is, is green like that, it's going to take the nitrogen away from that tree. So you're going to want to maybe top dress it with uh, are these, cotton seed meal. Or are these even, big older plantings you, know, you put it yeah. around or younger? Oh, they're mature trees. They're almost mature uh, trees. It probably, okay. it probably yeah. won't make yeah. a big difference. Yeah. But it's going to be equivalent to putting sawdust down, as long as you don't get it very yeah. deep because it'll seal up. Or if yeah. it, as it breaks down, which it'll do fairly quickly, it ties up to nitrogen. I, if they're big established trees, yeah, I wouldn't do anything. But okay, ideally, thank you. ideally you'd let your chips age a little bit yeah. Yeah. before you put them down. We, and you we didn't have, have that to problem. dig out at all. You could just put them on, yeah, on, top, on top of the, you know. And they leave you with a lot of sawdust or a lot of chip. There's yeah, no doubt when they, they do. do a tree, that's the they first do. question they ask us is, uh, you guys want the chip? <laughs> so. <laughs> Not really, no. All right, well, we're going to go to another question. We've got line six, and the question is where to plant flowers. Hopefully you'll be able to fill us in, and that's, uh, if you fill us in a little details about where you'd like them or. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you for taking my call. Uh, I have three plants that were given to me. My husband just recently died, and they're plants that people gave me. I was 
hoping to be able to develop like a memory garden area with them, but I don't know if they can all three uh, survive in the same place. One's an azalea, there's a begonia, and a hydrangea. I wonder if they're florists. Yeah. yeah that might be the problem. So the the ones you got n aren't necessarily hardy uh, in the Midwest for the outdoors. The begonia is definitely not. Definitely right. not. The hydrangea okay. and the azalea, there's a question about those as well. If you have um, a very sunny, uh, like a, a sun porch or a, a real sunny exposure in your home, you might want to think about just keeping those as house plants. I, probably um, the way to, if it, if it looked like it came from a nursery, maybe in a bigger can, but if it's in a nice florist, yeah, pretty it's pot. probably a greenhouse raised type that's made not to go outside into the yard. Yeah. With the hydrangea also? Yeah, unless yeah. you're unless you're uh, in zone seven. Yeah, I was gonna say the good news is most yeah. it, most of the non hardies those forever blooms or whatever yeah. they're calling they tend yeah. to be six sometimes seven so yeah. you're you're pushing it so a microclimate in your yard you have a mm -hmm. shot okay. but yeah. okay. it's gonna it's be a little tougher they're they're probably right you might want to do a porch or bring them out in the summer and and then bring them back in in the winter. Yeah, if oh, you okay. yeah, you could yeah, exactly. That's perfect, Shane. You could use them for container plants on a shady porch, you know, because azaleas and hydrangeas actually both thrive in the shade, so they I really see. don't want you want sun inside the house because in a sunny window because there's just never enough light inside of a house. But if you have it outdoors, even on a shaded porch, the light is so much brighter even than inside your house. It doesn't seem like it to your eye, but it is. So you might, yeah, you might just try those as container plant, patio plants, and then bring them in in the winter. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Oh, thank I you really for calling. Your program. Thank oh, you. The, the guy with the chips around the trees. If you want to use fresh chips like that, put some newspaper down where you want to put them. Where you want to put the chips down. Just right on top of the grass or wherever you want to, or in the bed where you're putting. Put newspaper down two or three or four thicknesses, and then put the chips on top of that. And by the time the chip ages, the paper will. Right decompose away. and then hmm. you you won't have quite such a, a nitrogen robbery there in your planting bed so that's a good tip there <coughs> all right we're going to move to another question we're going to move to line two and the question is about peonies line two are you there you have a question for us yes i do i have a two-fold question all my right. name is barb and i'm from decatur um how soon can you dig up peonies um, right now they're about four inches above the ground, but I want to transplant them to a different yard. And also, can you transplant a, tr a peony tree? How would you go about that? Yeah. Well, I, you could turn. Yeah. Go. Tr well, I was going to say peonies, anytime they're up, I think you could do them. If you knew exactly where you could probably do it. For, it now's the time to do it once it dries mm -hmm. down, but now's yeah. the time to do it. And they're that fairly short, like you're saying, just a mm -hmm. few inches. It'd be time to do it now. Okay, and then what about the peony tree? You can you just treat those like any shrub. Just you take treat a, it, yeah, treat it like a take shrub. Take a good a good portion of you know plenty of soil around the root ball. Use a sharp spade. Mm -hmm. You know, cut a circle all the way around it, get it nice and loose. But actually, I would think about transplanting that in the okay. fall, it's, maybe. I'm not going to say it's know. the easiest thing because I've moved no. some and not had them make it too. Yeah, so. they're a little particular. But yeah, if you ask us officially on peonies, those are those are sum, late summer, fall transplants. When we plant peonies yeah. in pots, we yeah. always we try and do it in the in the late tree, summer. Tree peony uh, yeah. likes to be where it is and not. If it's a yeah. great big old plant, I don't know. I, you'd have yeah. to take a big root ball, but if you just you treat it like it a there. shrub, you treat the tree mm -hmm. peony more like a shrub than you would a. The tree peony is like a, about four foot tall and about two foot in circumference. Yeah, you're gonna have to put a big root that's ball a, on that that's one. A, that's a, you're moving a tree. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. You're moving a very large shrub there. And you wouldn't want to, you could bare root it if it was August, but you wouldn't okay. want to be bare rooting it now. And the one thing I can tell you too, because I've killed lots of them, overwatering is one of the easiest ways to kill new roots or new transplants. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, would not, if you had transplanted it last week, this would not be a good week. Um, so you really have to be careful about overwatering. We, I've killed a lot of $100 peony, fern leaf peonies by overwatering. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so I really would be better off to wait till August. I think so. That's just when we do it and we have mm -hmm. best yeah. luck. But peonies are peonies. Like yeah. a regular peony, it's kind of like a hosta. You can't mess it up too bad right. yeah. when it comes to peonies. They're pretty tough plants all across the board. 
Well, it, thank you very much. It might be a good idea for you to label the ones that are the colors that you want, and you know, get a little a little aluminum tag or a little string tag, twine tag, something that is a little bit more weatherproof, and you can definitely mark the ones you want. And then in the fall or in the late summer, just cut down the ones you want. Just cut them, cut the cut the stems down to three or four inches high and cut them out with a sharp spade and move them then. And don't worry that they don't have any tops on them because they're peonies. Yep, they've melted away. <laughs> it's not a problem. Now you tell me to label yeah. them. My <laughs> miscellaneous <laughs> peony patch. And, and one other factor about that is it may take you a couple of years to come back in a bloom once you transplant them, though. Yeah, yeah, they might. But if they come <clears throat> up the next spring, you're golden. It's not a problem. Yeah. They're peonies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They'll be a broken down house, but there'll be peonies in front oh, of yeah, it. Oh yeah, 50 years ago. Yeah. yeah. All right, we're going to move on to another question, line three. We got a question about our vegetable garden. Hi. Um, yes, my vegetable garden and part of my herb garden is submerged in <laughs> water right now, and I tilled in. Uh, are you there? Yeah, yeah. we're listening. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, I till before I planted. I tilled in mushroom compost. And because of all this constant rain, I'm wondering if it's all diluted and neutral by now. That's question number one. Number two, and are any of my seeds going to survive? Number three, I wanted to create raised beds using cinder, cinder blocks, and I wanted to plant vegetables in the holes in the cinder blocks. And I was wondering if there's any chemical problem using cinder blocks around a raised bed or planting in the hole in the cinder block. Well, <clears throat> we've had people in the Chicago area use cinder blocks a lot. And the problem with the cinder block is what kind of vegetables you can grow in that because mm -hmm. of the limited root system the little holes in the cinder block, uh, block allow. Right. So if you want to grow a tomato plant, uh, I would not consider putting it inside the cinder block, but I'd take several cinder blocks and make its own raised bed for that one plant or multiple plants based on how much area you have. Mm -hmm. um, as for the seeds, uh, probably depends on how long they stay under water and <laughs> whether or not they'll rot. How far they washed away. Yeah. yeah. Oh, <laughs> I know. See, your no. neighbor may be it, doing the garden. Yeah. It's <laughs> how about the compost? Am I going to have to recompost again? No, no. unless it no. floats away. No. It's still organic matter is still there unless it physically yeah. floats it's away. It's not going to neutralize it, dilute the nitrogen, all this water? No, well, no, the, no. The, no. The primary function of that is going to be to um, just add organic matter to your soil so you lighten it up. so. Air and water and nutrients can get yeah. there. What I'm saying you know. is, I already added mushroom compost, but it's been raining for days. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but your it's, organic I wouldn't, matter wouldn't worry about yeah. it. Or organic worry. matter releases nutrients very slowly, so yeah. it, you know it's not going to leach that great amount out, mm -hmm. even if it stays wet for several weeks. And you said it's no problem to create a raised bed with cinder blocks. No, okay. no, there's nothing in the cinder blocks themselves. No, no. Oh, good. I mean, Thank they're gonna, you. They're going to leach a little calcium, but yeah, no, no, no big no. deal. Not for vegetables. <coughs> doesn't matter. Yeah. All right. We're going to try and squeeze in one more question. It's got to be a quick question. Blueberries. So we're going to go to line four about blueberries. You've made it in. So if you can ask a quick question. Hello? Yeah. Yes. Is there a rule of thumb about how much sulfur should be applied to uh, the soil of blueberry plants? Uh, they're in about 15-gallon pots now, and I plan to move them up into I think they're about um, 30 gallon. So uh, you're going to move them into a larger pot? Yeah. Well, then you should test the soil and see how much sulfur you really need. Well, and they um, they're in largely compost with uh, sphagnum moss, and, and, and gonna, they show the need of more um, uh, sulfur. Are you, okay. Uh, based on that, now when I used to do a lot of soil testing. We also told people that if you had to add more than two pounds of sulfur per thousand square feet, you would burn the roots off with a sulfur amount. Mm -hmm. So if you need more than two pounds of sulfur to lower the pH down to the point where you actually need, you know, need to keep it, uh, then do it in uh, uh, different amounts, like one pound now and then two or three weeks later add another pound. So you're not putting on more than two pounds and burning the roots off the plant. And that's per how many gallons of? Uh, well, you'd have to take a thousand square feet, and uh, and that's basically always based on six inches of depth, and so you take thousand square feet uh, band, times six yeah. inches to get your cubic, and then prorate it down to fit your pot. So not a lot. No, I not just did my much. math in my head. It's yeah. not a lot. No. Okay, but definitely more than the two or three 
tablespoons of salt that I've been using. Right. Yeah, maybe so more like a cup. But you need to do your math correctly and make sure you don't overdo it because you will burn roots with sulfur. And you said two pounds to a thousand square feet. Uh huh. Is maximum. Is maximum. You don't don't try and see that. And that's why I suggested one pound per thousand uh, square feet, and then uh, put the next pound on several weeks later, or work it in several weeks later. Yeah, I could probably go even less than that with the uh, compost and peat moss. But yep. Yeah, well. that, it won't take very much. Well, that's uh, that's all the time we have this evening. We're uh, this is our time of year, isn't it? We get a lot yeah. more than this yeah. during the week, yeah. so we're yeah. kind of the rock stars of this time of season. So, <laughs> well, thanks for calling in. I hope you enjoyed Mid American Garden this evening. See, t uh, check with us next week. Thank you very much. <laughs>